So in today's lecture, uh, we'll continue, if you can recall, last term lecture, we had one lecture on metals and alloys. In the previous lecture, we discussed basic structure of metals and what are basic properties. We'll discuss about uh, various types of metals and alloys which we use in dentistry and their composition, their classification, and their related properties. And at the end, I will go through a lost wax technique again, because if there is any confusion, you, you will be able to discuss with me about that. Right, so let's start with, uh, I just would like to recall metallurgy, is the study of metals and their mixtures, which is alloy. So this is from our previous term lecture. We, we are aware of basic properties of metals and alloys. Now in this lecture, we will talk about more applied uh, knowledge, which we use in dentistry about this. Right, so basically there are three main groups of metals. The first one is called noble metals. These are metals which, which have very low reactivity, which means they do not react in the environment. So they don't oxidize, they don't get corrosion. Typical examples of these metals are gold, platinum, and palladium. So if you see, for example, gold, it does not react in the water, in the, in the air, so it does not get rusted. While I will jump to base metals, base metals are opposite. They are more reactive. They react in the oxygen, they react in water, so they get rusted or corroded. For example, iron. Iron, cobalt, chromium. So these are uh, all metals which are more reactive than uh, noble metals. While the precious metals, precious as from the name, Precious means valuable. So these metals are expensive. For example, gold, silver, also platinum. So these metals are expensive and they are categorized as precious metal. So we, we always look for uh, any replacement, any cheaper metal that we can use to replace precious metals. So these are three main groups of metals and which we mix them to make alloys. So this, this slide is very much from uh, your previous lecture. I just revise it to recall the previous knowledge so you can understand where we are now. Right, so metals are not commonly used. Most commonly we used alloys. And there are only few applications of metals which we use in dentistry. For example, uh, gold or platinum in the form of foil. Historically, it was used uh, gold foil filling, but now it is very rare. Similarly, we use mercury in amalgam or titanium we use for making dental implants. Also, titanium is not very common because mostly we use titanium alloy, not pure titanium. So I give you examples of uh, applications in dentistry. In general dentistry, we have all our instruments, hand instruments, and a lot of other uh, equipment made by uh, alloys. And mostly they use uh, steel as steel. We will talk about steel as well uh, for biomedical applications. In restorative dentistry, we have crown, bridge, we have filling materials like amalgam, which is made of than alloys. Endodontics, all the instruments, which we use for root canal treatment, they are made of metals and alloys. Prosthetic dentistry, we have dentures, cast plates, articulators, impression trays, they are made of metals or alloys. In oral surgery, we use various types of fixtures, plates to fix the fractures. Uh, they are made of usually 
stainless steel or we can have some titanium also orthodontics we have uh, various types of wires brackets springs they are mostly made of metals so it is very clear that we have a wide range of applications from uh, metals so now in terms of alloys when we mix uh, two metals or more than two metals it makes an alloy and we discuss in detail in the last term that we commonly use alloys not metals because pure metals are difficult to uh, purify and use them for application so that is why we use alloys and there are two main groups of alloys one is called wrought alloy and one is called casting alloy so what is the difference in both in wrought alloy we can use as they are available to us for example wire orthodontic wire dentist clasp wire or any this kind of material which is wrought alloy we don't do anything with them we simply wire we take it we cut bend or we use for our application so these are wrought alloys which we are which are available for immediate application in contrast casting alloy comes in small pieces we have we have shown in the last lecture to some of the student the uh, samples of casting alloy they come in block they come in cylinders so we melt them at high temperature so use this molten metal to give any shape so they are commonly used for making crowns bridges as a part of lost wax technique in dentistry we, we are using both types casting alloy and wrought alloy so let's discuss wrought alloy first of all like uh, which material we use for making wrought alloy and what are their applications in uh, dentistry right so uh, wrought alloys most commonly they are used at room temperature so we can mechanically bend them and typical example is uh, wire wires orthodontic wires which we use for uh, orthodontic treatment that is made of wrought alloy similarly the denture clasps uh, which we use are made of wrought alloys so wrought alloy does not need any much heat treatment or melting them they are available and they are easy to use at room temperature so the typical is the stainless steel most commonly we use stainless steel here are the examples orthodontic wires and surgical splints endodontic files they all are made of wrought alloys and for example if we want to use these wires we can bend them for root canal treatment we can give them any shape for uh, curved canals so these are applications of wrought alloys in wrought alloys as i said most commonly is used as steel steel which we all now know is carbon uh, and iron but just keep in mind the carbon is very little like the carbon is in the form of traces while stainless steel which is advanced form we add 13 percent chromium minimum 13 percent it can be more than uh, 13 percent so the chromium in chromium results in formation of chromium resistance because chromium is a metal that causes uh, chromium resistance so due to chromium it does not get rusted so this is the benefit of adding chromium and addition of chromium make it stainless steel which means it will not get chromium very easily so i have added these are main components of stainless steel wrought alloy and their function chromium is causing passivity which means it make it chromium resistance similarly nickel is added uh, which give it a strength and of course we have uh, iron main component and we have some traces of molybdenum 
silicon manganese and this kind of uh, metals we add for various functions like strengthening the alloy deoxidizer so what is to remember the main components remain iron chromium and nickel so main point here to remember is for all alloys there are three main metals or four main metals or it could be two main metals and rest are many other metals like in very few quantity for example one percent less than one percent for specific function so mainly we recognize alloys on behalf of main metals which are used for example in this alloy stainless steel we have main metals iron chromium and nickel so similarly will be the case of uh, casting alloy in casting alloy also we remember metals uh, sorry we remember alloys with the name of main component metals so why we use why we use stainless steel very commonly because it is uh, it is not expensive it is cheap excellent formability we can give it any shape good mechanical properties and can be soldered and welded for example if we need to join two components we can do that easily with stainless steel uh, rot alloys so these are the properties that is why it is commonly used but we have some other uh, some other rot alloys also for example uh, nickel titanium which is the second common commonly used and it is also called memory shape alloy because it does not change its shape it's typically used for uh, orthodontic wires application because it does not shape it does not change shape so uh, we use them for shaping the arch during the orthodontic treatment as you can see from the name nai tai so its main components are nickel 55% and titanium 45% and then we we might have traces of other uh, metals such as cobalt 2% or we can have some other additives also in minor quantity so we cannot remember or uh, memorize all composition but we can memorize two main components at least for example nickel titanium we have nickel majority 55 percent and then titanium 45 percent similarly we have beta titanium alloy uh, which has better ductility and corrosion resistance but this is uh, these are the uh, commonly used titanium based alloys and same applications as nickel titanium only the composition is a little different. Uh, they have increased titanium to 78% and uh, zirconium 6% compared to the nickel titanium, which has titanium up to 45%. Also, we have cobalt, chromium, nickel alloy, where we have added uh, cobalt and chromium to nickel. Remember this we commonly use for uh, casting alloy, but sometimes very little application we get as a rot alloy. Tarnish and corrosion resistance due to presence of chromium. Hard material and mechanical properties are very good and similar to that of stainless steel. But why this is not commonly used? Because properties are similar to stainless steel, while the stainless steel is cheaper. This is bit expensive so that is why stainless steel is commonly used yes is everyone with me are you understanding yes yes doctor yes i know this is a difficult time you getting a lot of information and uh, from multiple lectures so this is very difficult to absorb all information unless you read it back. Right, I go back to this slide where we classify two major types of alloys, rot alloys and casting alloys. So we already discussed about rot alloys, uh, which we commonly used. I just summarize, we use it for wires, endodontic instruments, hand instruments, which we don't 
treat with the temperature, with high temperature. In contrast, now we are going to discuss about the casting alloy. In casting alloy, we it comes available in pieces which we melt at high temperature. So at high temperature, they become liquid of low viscosity. So we can use that liquid to give any shape and let it cool down. So it is linked to a lost wax technique. The wax pattern which we make, we burn the wax pattern and fill that space with the casting alloy. So let's start with the uh, properties of casting alloy. Considering that casting alloy materials are used in the mouth, in oral cavity. So it has to be biocompatible. For any material which we use in mouth should be biocompatible. So it should be non-toxic, non-irritant and inert. Inert mean it should not make reaction with saliva or with food. Least corrosion. So for that purpose, uh, noble metals are important because they do not react. Or from base metal, we can add chromium because that enhances passivity. High melting point. So they melt at high temperature and be safe at uh, room temperature and mouth temperature. Good mechanical properties. They should be very strong, high yield strength. Minimal shrinkage because we cool, we uh, heat, heat them up at high temperature at melting point, which is might be 1000 degree plus. So when we cool them down, they should have little dimensional changes, little cooling shrinkage. Cheap and easy to manipulate. So cheap is stainless steel, but we don't get other properties good in stainless steel. So that is why it should be cheap, but not, not the only property to consider. Low viscosity. So this low viscosity is in molten form when we uh, melt them at high temperature, it should be low viscosity. So it can flow into uh, our lost wax pattern and record the fine details, like produce sharp margins, sharp details, fissures and pits in the prosthesis. Should be malleable and ductile for cold working. So if you remember from the investment, uh, we showed you the uh, metallic sprues. So metallic sprues only easy to cut if material is ductile. Otherwise it is very difficult and hard to cut. So for that purpose, we need material to be malleable and ductile. So this is set of properties which we are looking ideally for a casting alloy for dental application. Now the classification of casting alloy, we have noble, noble alloys or also called precious metal and we have uh, uh, base metal alloys and we have uh, basically it depends on percentage of noble metals which are gold and platinum. That is why I showed you on the first slide so you understand what are noble alloys. So noble alloys at least 60% uh, or more for categorizing as a noble alloy. And if it is less, it, it might be semi-noble, like 25% or whatever. In contrast, base metals, we have less than 25%. Still in base metal alloys, we might have some component coming from noble or precious metal, like we can add little uh, quantity of gold or platinum, but has to be less than 25%. But the main metals we use in base metal are nickel, cobalt, chromium, and titanium. Sorry, chromium is not mentioned here, but chromium is one of the main metals which we use in base metal. The uh, <clears throat> other qualification uh, classification is according to uh, American Dental Association and based on strength. So they uh, classify type 1, 2, 3, and 4. And type 1 
soft and they increase to type 4 extra hard and they categorize that according to the application like the soft one for inlays and extra hard for partial dentures. Right. Now the important part is to understand the composition. How we understand the composition because each component will affect on the properties. For example, what is the property of parent metal? If we have gold, what is the property of gold? If we have platinum, what is the property of platinum? So same property is likely to reflect in the uh, alloy. Are you clear about this point? Because this is very important. For example, if gold is soft and we have too much gold, the alloy will be very soft. And if platinum is increasing strength, if we have too much platinum, it might be very, very strong. So this is, this is why it is important to understand uh, properties of each metal, which are part of these alloys. Are you clear about this? Yes, doctor. So for example, I take gold again. So gold is soft, ductile, malleable, corrosion resistant and expensive. So what will happen if we have high amount of gold in some alloy? So it will be, first of all, it will be expensive. So which is against the ideal property. It has to be cheap and it might be very soft. So again, this is not an ideal property. We don't want very soft. Similarly, platinum increased strength. And if you see copper is also hardener. Zinc is added as a scavenger. So material does not oxidize when we store it. Now, in the next slides, when I explain to you the composition, you will understand the properties also. And you will also understand the function of these metals. For example, if gold is reducing, what is going to happen? If gold is increasing, what is going to happen? So let's talk about gold first of all, because gold uh, is important as it is <clears throat> used for uh, various gold-based alloy also. So gold can be classified according to purity also, uh, for example, 24 carat to nine carat, depending on how much percentage gold is. So this is another uh, parameter, how we classify gold alloys, but we can also classify according to hardness. If we see ADA classification, we can classify gold base alloy according to hardness. Type one soft, which means it has a huge portion of gold and type four, which means it will have less gold and other metals to make it hard. So gold, as we all know, it is biocompatible. There is no issue with compatibility. It is highly corrosion resistant, but heavy. Its density is very high. So patient might complain the denture or prosthesis is very high, very heavy. So they will feel the weight. It is soft, so that is why we add hard metals to make alloy. And commonly used metals for making alloy are platinum, platinum, silver. So when we add these metals, they increase its strength and hardness. Also, they might change the color as well, like platinum and platinum are white, silver is also whitish. So, uh, these metals might change the color. Otherwise, yellow is prominent color and uh, which might be aesthetically not good for uh, oral respirations because yellow color uh, is not good. But it might be changed to white colors with the addition of uh, silver, platinum, or platinum, which are uh, white color. Now, uh, I mean, on this slide, I'm telling you how we improve the bad properties of gold. So color, we change it to white by adding platinum and platinum. We reduce the melting range by adding low melting point metals. We make it lighter weight by adding 
other metals original density is 19.3 which is reduced to 15.2 in case of type 4 more user friendly uh, compared to base metal because base metal are very hard and very difficult to cut resistance to tarnish and corrosion and gold alloy casting shrinkage is also less than base metal uh, we will have a comparison on one of the slide so this slides compare effect of composition and classification of gold alloy so we classify type one two three four according to their hardness soft if you observe soft 85 percent gold so this is one of the property of gold it is very soft metal so once we have 85 percent gold it is soft and then it reduced to 75 percent gold it become medium and 65 percent gold it become very hard and how we are achieving hardness by adding copper because copper is three percent we increase it to 15 percent to make it harder so if you recall the previous slide the property of copper was hardener because it make alloy hard this is a comparison of properties how uh, composition affects on the properties of alloy because we are using we are using the same composition only we are changing their uh, composition in percentage but their properties are being changed type 1 to type 4 as we reduce gold hardness is increasing mechanical properties increasing strength increasing ductility is decreasing corrosion resistance is decreasing so you can clearly see the properties linked to gold if we reduce gold, those properties are reducing i hope you understand this idea like how the composition affects on the properties so there is an idea of low gold content uh, which means gold is very expensive and uh, which is one of the drawback and one of the obstruction for using gold alloy so we might add silver in gold alloy to replace gold uh, i mean silver is cheaper so it might uh, reduce the cost but the important point is silver cause precipitation of uh, gold alloy which is not good for properties so only thing we have to take care of we have to add platinum the platinum prevents press, uh, gold alloy and does not let it affect the properties and most important is the ratio of platinum and silver the amount of silver we add one percent platinum should be added for every three percent silver for example, if we add 3% silver, we will add 1% platinum. If we add 6% silver, we add 2% to keep it a balance and not affecting the properties. So therefore, if we are replacing gold and their proportion should be balanced carefully. So now we come to the base metal alloy, which is an another cheaper alternative to gold alloys. Right. So this is the importance why we focus on base metal alloys because they are cheaper. Gold is very expensive and they are having many, many similar properties and many properties are even better than gold alloy. So we will discuss that. Firstly, cheaper so less cost stiffer than gold alloy some of the base metal alloys are even harder than gold alloy excellent mechanical properties which is a good point but on the other hand it's also a bad point because cutting and finishing and polishing may be very difficult as we have two main examples cobalt chrome and nickel chrome and nickel chrome is more ductile good corrosive resistance due to chromium because chromium make is make it corrosive resistance and uh, density density is very low compared to gold alloys because gold is very heavy it's, uh, dense metal and fusion temperature is 1200 to 1500 degrees centigrade 
So briefly, we uh, talk about the composition uh, nickel chromium alloy or commonly used uh, alloy, but later on it has been replaced with cobalt chrome instead of uh, nickel chrome because nickel chrome has uh, some toxicity or biocompatibility issue. If you see, as name suggests, nickel chrome. So the main composition is nickel, which is like 60 to 61 to 81 percent, and then chromium, which is 18 to 27 percent. So this alloy is mainly made of nickel and chromium. And then we have traces of other metals like tin, beryllium, silicon, just very little, 0.1%, 1%. So no two are important. The main issue with this nickel chrome is allergy or toxic reaction. About 10 to 12% patients may complain about allergy, which is coming from nickel. So the solution comes up uh, by replacing nickel with cobalt. So in cobalt chrome alloys, we replace nickel with uh, cobalt. Sometimes they add very little nickel and because it range zero to 20%, but most of modern cobalt chrome alloy are having no nickel. So they might, they also name nickel free because we were having issue with nickel allergy or toxicity in the oral cavity or even on the skin. So cobalt and chromium main composition. And then we have traces of other metals. So we only need to memorize this main component, which is also clear from name, cobalt, chromium. Application are denture base, uh, making partial dentures, complete dentures, crown and bridges, and bar connectors. So they are classified as hard and uh, these two components i would say cobalt and chrome should be high amount like 85 percent or plus so these are again properties of base metal alloys in base metal alloys we have cobalt to increase strength that has replaced nickel chromium has the same function nickel uh, similar to cobalt but that is why we can replace it with cobalt due to allergy issues. And we have grain refiner, molybdenum. So it, it controls the grain size. And uh, deoxidizer, we have low melting range, um, beryllium. So these are, these are traces. So I would say you need to remember the function of main three uh, metals. So our uh, meeting link might expire. So we all uh, would join on the uh, new meeting link if this one expires. And we can continue from there. Okay, so advantages. Now, what are the advantages of uh, base metal? They are lightweight, strong, less expensive, and corrosion resistance, resistance is almost like gold alloy. So these are the benefits responsible for popularity of base metal alloys because they are fulfilling many ideal properties and cheaper than gold. However, there are some drawbacks. They are very hard. So imagine if it is very hard like a stone. So they are not easy to cut and finish and polish. So this is one of the drawback for this one. Uh, biocompatibility issues might be there, but only for nickel chromium. Cobalt chromium, there are uh, no real biocompatibility issues. So I put this slide to make a comparison between base metal alloy and gold alloy. So this slide is good in the sense it give a good comparison between uh, base metal alloy and gold alloys. The one highlighted in green are good properties uh, which are desired or which are matching with the required properties. 
So I think this slide is important to remember for understanding the comparison of these two types of casting alloy. So first of all is cost. Of course, uh, base metal alloys are cheaper and gold is expensive. And hardness, base metal alloys are of course very hard material and very strong and stiff material. Gold also a uh, bit hard, uh, type 4 but not as hard as base metal alloys. Density, base metal is lighter weight, about half of the gold alloy, which is good. And manipulation of gold alloy is comparatively easier. Biocompatibility is better. Corrosion resistance is better and they are flexible. So these all properties are good in case of gold alloy. But for getting these properties, we have to pay extra cost because this is expensive material. Similarly, there is a dif some difference in uh, uh, temperature also, casting temperature. And ductility is important because uh, I would say ductility 4% in base metal is a good property because more ductile might change the shape of uh, denture or bridge. So I should make this one green. Right. Do you have any question about this? All right. So there are some more. Uh, by the way, these are these two categories are commonly used: base metal and gold. But we have some less commonly used casting alloy also. For example, titanium. Titanium has a property is it passivates very quickly in pure form. Like for example, if it get uh, some scratch or some uh, exposure of titanium metal to air, it immediately forms titanium oxide. And titanium oxide is very much corrosion resistant. So we use this uh, uh, for making dental implants. Again, Titanium in pure form is rarely used. We use it in the form of alloys, which contain titanium, aluminum, and vanadium. So this is the material which we use for dental implants mainly, but we can use it for casting. But casting has certain issues, which I will discuss why we don't use it commonly. And why we use this material for casting is some of its good properties. For example, biocompatibility. It is very biocompatible. That's why we use it for uh, dental implants. High sag resistance, which means it is stable at high temperature and we can use it for uh, metal ceramic restorations. Resistance to tarnish and corrosion, very uh, corrosion resistant because it immediately forms layer of titanium oxide on the surface, which is very much corrosion resistant. Color is lustrous, silvery white. Fusion temperature is very high. If you see, it's about 1700 degree, which is higher than other alloys. Density is lightweight, which is a benefit. Coefficient of thermal expansion is also high. Mechanical properties are good. You just simply remember it is good mechanical properties, like kind of gold alloy type three and type four. <clears throat> Why we do not use titanium alloy for casting procedures? Because if you see this, the temperature is very high. So if you want to use titanium for casting, we need a special equipment that can reach that temperature. So this is one of the main reason. And second reason it is it is very reactive. So once we heat it up at high temperature, it reacts immediately with the oxygen. Even at room temperature, it reacts with the oxygen to make uh, titanium oxide. So that is why we need uh, casting in a vacuum where there is no oxygen and we can use some inert gas like organ. So uh, briefly, it needs special equipment. It is expensive. It needs high temperature, uh, high a different type of investment as well as it is showing. Uh, so that on the other hand, it's uh, difficult to polish and finish and it might react with certain chemicals in the oral cavity. But in uh, for implant, it is different.
because they are manufactured at industrial scale. So that can be a suitable material for making dental implants. But for casting and for making dentures, it is not a suitable material. Right. So this slide is uh, just an introduction for our next lecture and final lecture next week, inshallah. Uh, porcelain bonded alloys. So if we are using a special type of restorations, which is called metal ceramic restorations, in which we use inner layer of metal and surface of porcelain or ceramic. So these restorations, we have a complete lecture. We will talk about that. But this slide, I just put an introduction in terms of uh, casting alloy for this type of restorations. So they should withstand high temperature so we can fire porcelain easily. It should not melt up to the high temperature like 850 or to 1350. So it should remain stable. We can add certain uh, ingredients to induce oxide layer. If you remember from last term lecture, oxide layer is important to make bond between porcelain and metal. And we can add some uh, silver to give it bright color and a white copper to prevent bad color, which can be visible through translucent porcelain. Sag resistance should be high so it can stable when we are firing porcelain on top of it. Right, so um, I would like to revise lost wax technique because some of the students were not clear uh, about this lost wax technique. So I put this again in this lecture and I will revise it again. And I hope you can better understand after seeing things in the laboratory and you're seeing the uh, investment process. So you have better understanding now. So how this lost wax technique works. We make wax pattern or a wax template using a very soft inlay wax. Why we make with wax? Because it is easy to shape. It is easy to uh, give a shape of crown, make cusp, make uh, pits and fissures. And we then with the help of lost wax technique, we replace this same shape into metal. So we do investment. We, may, we put into a ring. So this is the investment which you were shown in the last uh, laboratory session. And we put with the help of a sprue with the, uh, with the stock into this ring and fill it with the investment plaster. So once it's set, we heat it up at high temperature, 500 degree it burn out. So at 500 degree, this investment which you can see in gray color, it will remain there because it is resistant to very high temperature. But its wax will burn out, leaving this space empty. So empty space, we have exactly this shape. We can see empty space here. And now we have a special furnace, which is uh, melting casting alloy. And casting molten alloy is very low viscosity thin, which we pour into this space, burnout space. And after pouring into burnout space, we replace this wax into casting alloy. Break this ring, we take this out. This is in, inside the ring here in this ring, it is in, inside the ring. We break this investment ring with hammer and we take it out. And then we, after we take it out, we finish it, polish it, and it is ready to be inserted in patient's mouth. So this is a brief summary of lost wax technique. We start with the uh, wax pattern and we go through this whole procedure to replace this wax made crown into casting alloys, which can be placed into the mouth. I hope it is clear now. If you have any questions, you are welcome to ask me now. Doctor, do I have to know all the numbers? 
Because there is a massive amount of numbers in this lecture. Yes, uh, this is very much expected question uh, because I get this question every year from students. Numbers are not important, but they are important also. As I said, uh, for main numbers, yes, you need to know. For example, cobalt chrome alloy, what it is made of. So you should know it is made of cobalt and chrome. And I mean, you should remember three main components which it is made of. If you cannot memorize the whole list, uh, the three main components you should remember, you should remember and memorize. But not all the numbers, because all other numbers are just to give you an uh, idea, like what can be inside uh, each. Thank you.